Good morning, everyone. Well, afternoon now, so uh, I'm still early. Um, I'm Amber Mitchell, Public Engagement and Community Programs Coordinator here at the National World War II Museum, and we are so glad that each and every one of you are able to join us today for our lunchbox lectures that happen every first and third Wednesday of every month. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping things before we get started. Please silence all cell phones in the room as a courtesy to our speaker. Um, before we get started. Some upcoming events that are coming down the pipeline in February and March. On February 21st, we have Fighting for the Right to Fight in Louisiana, uh, which is a panel of scholars and veterans of World War II talking about what it was like to be an African American soldier during the war and from Louisiana. And that is on uh, February 21st, that is a Wednesday at 6 p.m. here in this building, <coughs> in Louisiana Memorial Pavilion. Um, on March 27th, we have a rescheduling of our film, Mon Cher Camarade, uh, which will be going on at the Solomon Victory Theater at a, uh, the film starts at 6 o'clock, the reception starts at 5. Are there spots still available in there? There is, there are spots, but they will be going quickly, so go online and register for that. Um, today's presentation is streaming live on Facebook and will be available for viewing in its entirety on both the museum's Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash www2museum, and later on the museum's YouTube channel. Um, feel free to share that stream with any of your Facebook friends who might be interested, and if you are watching live this afternoon, please feel free to offer up a question to our speaker in the comments section, and we will revisit that at the Q&A at the end. Now that housekeeping's out the way, let me uh, introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jason Dawsey. Dr. Dawsey is the DPAA Special Projects Historian in Residence here at the National World War II Museum. Here at the museum, he investigates cases involving American personnel still unaccounted for from the Second World War. Uh, his PhD is in Modern European History, which he earned in 2013 from the University of Chicago and he's taught at the University of Southern Mississippi and the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. His research focuses on critiques of modern technology, especially the work of Austrian theorist Gunter Anders. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Dawson. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Well, let me first say thanks to Amber and to the museum for giving me this opportunity. I haven't had a chance to speak in front of a group in several months. I spend most of my days looking at a computer screen, so it's really great to see y'all and to know you would come out at carnival season for an event where beads are not involved. So, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, so I want to just say a few things, kind of building on the introduction that Amber provided about me and about what my background is and what I do here and then just to kind of give you a sense about what I'm going to talk about I don't have a lot of visuals six or seven to show I'll explain a little later why I can't show a lot of things they're just things I cannot really show or even tell you about I have to speak in in generalities but I hope that doesn't really hold us up or obstruct I think what I wanted to convey to you today so just something about me in that I first came to this museum in 2002 when it was still the D-Day Museum. And like so many people who come here for the first time, I was really blown away by the experience and came back several times since. And so having the opportunity to work at the now National World War II Museum has been an incredible uh, thrill. I love coming to work every day. I'm one of those people I don't have to, I don't ever dread doing what I do. I really love it and care a lot about it and believe it's extremely important. But what I was working on in graduate school, and Amber mentioned some of my research, I studied with Moshe Postone and Michael Geyer at the University of Chicago. And so World War II was really central to what I worked with with them and coursework and the like. And then I decided to do this dissertation on this figure named Gunter Anders who he was a German Jewish writer who came to the US in 1936. He was not only Jewish but a leftist, which in Nazi Germany was a double whammy. 
he had gotten out of the country right after the Reichstag fire, spent time in Paris, and then came to the U.S. And then when I was working on him, though, I was interested in the war period. He's in exile in the U.S. throughout World War II, and then he goes back to Europe in 1950. But when I worked on him, I worked on his post-war career. And he was very involved in opposition to nuclear weapons. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a really profound moment for him intellectually and politically. So I ended up spending all this time interested in his war period, but you know, the, the way research goes, it often takes you in a different direction. So in fact, my academic work was on World War III, if you will, a third world war that thankfully never happened. But when the opportunity came to work here at the museum, in many ways it was like starting with the things that had gotten me interested in history to begin with, in the Second World War. But in a new way, something different. And that topic, obviously what I'm doing here in my day-to-day -day work, is investigating issues surrounding American personnel still unaccounted for from the war. So I thought, what better way to start with an image, it's a modest one, it's, it doesn't really do the, the kind of lighting, so please forgive that. This image here, though, is from the Wall of the Missing at the American Cemetery in Margraten in the Netherlands. There's some 1,700 names on that wall, and what typically will happen when one of these individuals has been identified and recovered they put a rosette next to the name. Now there's cemeteries like this, of course, all over Western Europe. I had a chance to see the American Cemetery in Colville-sur-Mer in Normandy in 2011, an amazing experience. And so these walls of the missing, you'll find them at Newville, the cemetery in the Ardennes. Obviously, if you're in Honolulu, you see the American Cemetery there, in the Philippines, etc. American Battle Monuments Commission is responsible for maintaining these cemeteries and for the upkeep on these walls and for updating as new information comes along. So my work as a kind of segue, as a starting point, is to increase the number of rosettes that you see on these walls of the missing. That's obviously what our goals are, to recover, identify, repatriate remains of American soldiers from that war. So with that said, I thought, since I can't talk about the specifics of people I'm working on at the moment, what I thought I would do is show an individual who we can't talk about, at least as a starting point, and that's this individual here. Stalag Luf III from November 42 until December 1943. And this is what's interesting, where the record is a little shaky, but evidently he had a spill on the ice he slipped and fell, probably suffered a concussion, and had some real damage to his eardrum. This is at least what we can tell from the records. But whatever it was, and it may have been more involved in it than that, his, meta, his health situation quickly began to go down. And the Germans transferred him to a hospital in Poland, where we know he died on January 24, 1944. And we know that he was buried by fellow prisoners. And the expectation all along that he had been there in the cemetery in Lubin, Poland. And this is now where the story gets interesting. And I'll, I'll, have to, I'll probably break this up, in fact, and return to it a bit later. After the war is over, there will be an effort in 1948 to find him. No evidence of where he was at. They're not able to do anything. And so the search for First Lieutenant Scania's remains is deferred. That's off of the language you see a lot in the records. And we don't really get track of him again until the early 2000s when investigators working on cases of missing come across his information again, and there's a new round of investigation. To make a long story short, there is a really happy ending with this particular case. On January 27, 2018, First Lieutenant Sconiers was buried in Dominiac Springs, Florida, as his hometown, right next to his mother. It took that long to find him. And one of the things I want to do before I wrap up today in the latter stages of the talk is maybe ask the question, why did it take so long? 
why did it take so long to find him? And many others. But if you go to DPAA, and I haven't even said anything yet about DPAA, if you go to their website, they'll always have updates about newly identified personnel, and he will be in the first six or seven that you'll see if you go to their website. But I want to at least show you something. We're going to come back to to First Lieutenant Sconiers a little later and raising this question and hopefully posing a few answers about why it took so long. So, obviously, as, as Amber noted, my role here at the museum is doing work for DPAA. So I thought one of the things I would do is just say a bit about the agency and about what kind of work that I do for it. But to, not to confuse anybody, but just to be clear, I'm an employee of the museum, but the work that I do for the museum is assigned by DPAA. All the work I get really is from them. So DPAA, as you can tell here, this is a, a great image I just took right off of their website. It gives you a real sense about the activities that they are involved in. I mean, first thing to note is what it stands for. Obviously, you're dealing here with lots of acronyms, but it's the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency that formed in early 2015. And it came out of a merger of some previous organizations, and I always have to keep, you know, given the acronyms here to make sure I do justice to it. But it came out of an organ two or three organizations that had been brought together by Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel really, in fact, ensured that this would happen. So let me do some, a brief background about it. In 2010, Congress passed a Defense Authorization Act whereby it charged the Department of Defense involved with missing cases that it would have to increase the number that it accounted for. Notice this term accounting that you see all the time. It would have to increase the number that it accounted for to 200 a year. That would be the goal. Prior to 2010, the focus had been on the Vietnam War. I think for m most of us, myself included, before I started this job, when you thought about MIA cases, most of us thought about Vietnam. It was a real flashpoint in that war, and of course the famous flag that people see dates from the Vietnam War, that had been where most of the energy and budget had been concentrated. But this Authorization Act insisted that 200 be the number, and it could not be only focused on Vietnam. The Second World War and Korea would also be included. Now what that meant for the community of people, researchers and the like who were doing this work, is that after 2010, and in fact, they set the goal for 2015 really being the year where this number would kick in. What that meant is that the number would increase to about 83,000 cases. And I'll say more about those numbers in a minute. Just under 73,000 of those are from World War II. I mean, the overwhelming number of them are from the Second World War. Those would have to be given priority as well, they would have to be included in that work. I mentioned Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. In 2014, he signed paperwork that entailed that DPAA would really bring together three previous agencies. This would be tasked with resolving these cases every year. And of course, what happened is in 2015, as these numbers began to kick in, DPAA, this newly created agency, it realized that dealing with 83,000 cases, as opposed to a few thousand, I mean, in the case of Vietnam, there are probably, ladies and gentlemen, about 1,600 or so unaccounted for. That's at least the latest number from the Vietnam War. They didn't have the people to do this. So this led to the Strategic Partnerships Office in DPAA reaching out to other institutions to help. Hence the partnership with the National World War II Museum. And I'll say more about the partnership and the like a little bit later on. But my role fits in with all of this 
In other words, why am I bringing all this in is that there has been a momentous shift in the priorities that the community of people working on these cases have to deal with just the sheer numbers. And that in turn has led to a real kind of focus on innovation. How do we reach out to other people who might help? And that will lead me to what I do with you. What I do here at the museum and, and the like. So before I say more about my own research, I just want to note here DPA's mission and values. I just put these things up for you to, to peruse. Obviously, it's mission statement <coughs> to provide the fullest possible accounting of our missing personnel to their families and the nation. And then the values that DPA holds as central. Compassion, respect, integrity, teamwork, innovation, and especially a couple of these things I will say more about in my own about my own approach to research. And I just put here, obviously, the partnership with the National World War II Museum dates from the summer of last year. There are several other institutions that are partnering with DPAA. I'm going to see if I can remember them all. Temple, Wisconsin-Madison, Texas A&M, University of Southern Mississippi, East Carolina, Ohio State, and in the process now, the ski as well. There are 11 of us all together, historians, genealogists, archaeologists, archivists, who do this kind of work. But let me just brag, the National World War II Museum is the only museum involved in doing that work. Every other one is a university. I think it says something, obviously, about the confidence they have in the museum and with good reason, as I'll show here in a minute. Okay, but that this gives you a sense about how DPA presents its case to the public about its mission and the values that inform the work that it does. Now, being here at the museum, ladies and gentlemen, is obviously a treat in and of itself. Just walking around the floors where you get that every day, but it's especially a great place to be able to do the kind of work that I do here. And you can obviously see the scope of it. So let me try to make sense of this map for you. This is a DPA map about the American missing altogether. They have numbers here, by the way, for Korea and Vietnam. We'll obviously be focused on the World War II numbers, but just under 73,000 Americans still unaccounted for from World War II. As you can see here, 48 plus thousand of those are from Asia Pacific, and just under 21,000 of those from Europe and the Mediterranean. That's what I work on, but I'll come back to that in a second. And the latest I saw about 980, roughly, from the state of Louisiana, are still unaccounted for from World War II. So this map, of course, shows you just the immensity of the task that DPA has now with this reorganization that took place really from 2010 through 2015. And the cases that I work on, all of them so far, I should just say, all of them have been from the European theater. All of them have been American prisoners taken captive by the Germans, 1942 to 45. And I'll say more about the specifics here in a few minutes, but at least gives you a sense about what people are up against. There are obviously other colleagues of mine working for DPA who are working only on Pacific Theater cases. But this is a sense of the numbers we are looking at. And I should just also add, I know these numbers after a while can be a bit overwhelming, but the best estimate the agency has right now is maybe 26,000 of them are actually recoverable of the 70, almost 73. Now, working here at the museum is, I really don't know a better place to be than to engage in this kind of research. Because here, this happened well before me. So I want to brag on colleagues for a second. What the World War II Museum has long established is what I would call a kind of collaborative research model. Now, as opposed to what? I imagine many of you probably just know this from history courses you've taken or you have kids taking history classes. 
But the kind of model that most of us who are historians are trained in is very solitary. You're trained as an individual. You have a set of research questions you want to pursue. You locate your sources, master those sources, and then at the end you produce a monograph, a book, an article or set of articles, a product really that synthesizes that kind of work. In many ways it's kind of like a secular monk model of work. You know, you think of the model of the monk bent over these, you know, these manuscripts kind of pouring over them. There's still a bit of that in the modern historical profession. It is very individual in terms of the type of work you do. And people are territorial. This is my project. My sources, whether that's, <laughs> in some cases, whether that's fair or not, and people have a kind of claim on work, and the profession values that, original research. But here at the museum, we, get, we have a, a different kind of model, and one that I think is especially suited for doing work on the American missing this collaborative research model. And I just note here a handful of things. This fourth one I'll come back to more at the end. But it's a team focus. Sharing information <coughs> takes priority over everything else. And if you have expertise on the subject, you help a colleague out who has less expertise. Right? This team approach. You know, we're all in this together, a sense of a common purpose or mission. The people I work with, especially in the Eisenhower Center, you don't have to get on the same page with them you already are. You're working on the same, maybe the same exact individual topic, but you're obviously interested in some of the same big questions. And that gives a kind of motivation to create something or provide a service for the public. It's not just for a scholarly community, it's for the general public. In my case, really providing a kind of service for them. And then this fourth point, that there's something about this research too that often differs from the way people understand history. Writing history, doing history, is an ethical dimension that I'll come back to. But let me just acknowledge some people that here at the museum who've really helped develop, hone this research approach long before I got here. My colleague, Clarice Soper, you'll meet her in a couple of weeks. <coughs> a genealogist working for DPAA, we were very fortunate to already fall into a shop where this was being done. So people like Keith Huxon, Seth Perrodin, Dan Olmstead, Hannah Daly, Kaylee Martin, Patrick Stephen, Tommy Lofton, who's now left us to work at the Armed Services, or the Armed Forces Museum at Camp Shelby, they really developed this. And so when I started here, especially in the first several weeks, you're just kind of learning your way around. You don't know where the bathroom is, right? You're still just kind of learning things, where everything is, et cetera. They really helped me out a great deal about, we have this, these materials available. We have these photographs available. And so that was already in play, and I've been able to tap a lot of that expertise in doing my work. So let me just say some things here about the kind of work that I do. And this map is not the greatest in the world, but it dates from February 1945. This is a map from the American Red Cross Bulletin from that month, which tries to identify all of the German <coughs> prison camps. And by the way, you can see, I hope you can see, all the red here that these camps are now in their present-day Germany, in Austria, present-day Czech Republic, present-day Poland. And I don't want to get into a, too much of a tangent since I work on 20th century Germany, but when you see the number of camps the Germans had during the war, and then you don't lose track of, this doesn't, of course, even come close to accounting for all the concentration and extermination camps that the Nazi regime managed. The people in the immediate post-war years after they began to see the remains of these camps, all of these camps, they talked about the Third Reich as a concentration camp universe. Because even this doesn't do justice to just with the POW camps, the sub-camps and satellite camps that the German military was managing. Right. So in this 
what do I work on? I'm interested in the fact that Kim Guy's here at the museum, in fact, did a wonderful exhibit about this in 2012. I'll put a, at least show you a link to that at the end. But Kim and others who've worked on this before me, what they establish is about 93,000 Americans were taken prisoner by the Germans during World War II. All but about 1,100 of those survived. So the mortality rate for Americans in German custody is remarkably low. If we were to switch to the Pacific Theater, I have not worked on Pacific Theater cases yet, but when I do, it'll be a very different situation there. About 40% of Americans don't survive captivity in Japanese hands. Conversely, if you're looking at, that's the American and British cases where the Germans generally adhered to the Geneva Conventions. There were definite breakdowns and the like, especially late in the war, but in general, the Germans did. Even when Hitler and Goebbels wished for, let's say, far more brutal treatment of Americans, especially pilots, but in general, there were war crimes, there was definitely maltreatment, but overall, those numbers are fairly small. If you were to compare this with the Soviet case, about 57% of the Soviet POWs the Germans take die. Either work to death, disease, or starvation. And it's interesting, in a lot of the files that I look at, you'll see American investigators are looking for American the remains of American personnel. They'll come across mass graves of Soviets that are not even registered. The Germans don't even bother registering. 1,200, 2,500. Soviet POWs in many cases. So it was a very different outlook where the Nazi regime is fiercely anti-Bolshevik and of course the anti-Semitism comes into play, all the Nazi racial ideology about Soviets, also about Poles, that leads to a very different treatment of their POWs. So in this case, Americans benefited, as did the British, from not falling askew with that racial worldview with some exceptions. We know of about a hundred or so, you know, constant, excuse me, we know about a hundred or so prisoner of war camps where Americans were held. In my case, I look at cases from right in this area up, really kind of east central, northeastern Germany, western Poland, these are the places where most of my research really does focus. And the main thing, the thing I do pretty much every day, I'm looking at these camps, and you can say that the printer's too small, but obviously most of these camps that I work on have the name Stalag, which is, in this case, is an abbreviation that would translate from the German as base camp or main camp, Stammlager, Mannschaft Stammlager. And many of us, I think when I was a kid, I loved Hogan's Heroes, right? Stalag 13, or some of you may know the Stalag 17 film or The Great Escape, obviously it's Stalag Luft 3. Luft is for pilots. So you have this maze, really, of camps in German and German-controlled territory. As I said, most of my work is here. And what I do, for the most part, is look at what are called IDPFs. Individual deceased personnel file is what that, what that means. That's my source base. It's not that that's the only thing I look at. I often look at the rich oral history collection the museum has. Sometimes I'll look at photos or even consult unit histories and the like. If there are German documents available, I certainly will take, I'll get to your question here in just a second. But if there are German documents available, I will often look at those, but the mainstay that I get from DPAA are these IDPFs. Now, what's in these? When you get these, and this is the part where I can only speak, of course, in generalities, but what you're going to find in these IDPFs, you'll have dental charts, any kind of evidence about this soldier's medical history that might be useful where they enlisted and when will be there. Then you'll have about, obviously, their involvement with their respective unit, the circumstances of their capture, and then usually as much detail as they can provide about where did the Germans take him? 
And so many of the cases I look at, a lot of the prisoners go to style log 4B, and then from there, they're transferred. And where they're transferred, that depends so much on circumstances. But in most cases, the decision for the Germans about where to transfer these Americans is where were they needed for work. That's what they're going to be doing. In most cases, it's some kind of labor construction work, railroad work, etc. That's the kind of things that they're usually going to be doing. So I'll have, obviously, all kinds of information in here about that, about where they ended up at, and then, of course, the circumstances about their death, and any information about possible burial sites. And then, never fails. Lots of these, you get extensive documentation from graves register, excuse me, graves registration service personnel, and that ranges from 1945. I have as late as 1955, 57, but basically we can say 45 until about 1953. Most of the cases I've looked at, you get this graves registration service documents. We looked here, no evidence of remains. We associated the individual with, or that's the term you see a lot, tried to associate the individual with these unidentified remains, unsuccessful. In fact, the term you see negative results that pops up again and again in these documents. And so what I look at are these cases and with a mind to producing a kind of comprehensive overview of these missing individuals, those that are still unaccounted for. I'm not going to give away too much about numbers, but I've looked at dozens of these already. You begin to look for patterns. How many of them are in this particular area? Maybe here or maybe here. You want to know if there's any evidence of maltreatment. I've seen cases where German guards certainly were not only just abusive, but killed Americans. But they're typically isolated, sporadic, not systematic brutality. And then what you see over and over again is once you get beyond the Battle of the Bulge, you see a big spike. I would say about 70 to 75 percent of the files I look at date from after December 16, 1944. Some 23,000 Americans captured during the Battle of the Bulge, including some 4,000 or so in one day, and you see a real increase for the Germans in, their, in these prison numbers, at least for American inmates. So many of my cases deal with, or all go back to the Battle of the Bulge and be amazing. I look at somebody from Indiana, a guy from, you know, from New York, a guy from Arizona, and you'll see December 17th or December 19th or December 21st, etc. That pops up over and over again. And since it's about 70 to 75 percent of those are after the Bulge, you also see patterns: dysentery, malnutrition. As we get into 1945, you get the terrible winter of 44, 45, and the Germans, as the fronts are collapsing everywhere, they're running out of food. They're running out of food for themselves, much less for these POWs, and so you see case after case about disease. And then the issue is, what do the Germans do with the body? Especially as they're beginning to evacuate these camps, not surprisingly, I'm working in this area, these camps, the Red Army's closing in, they're packing up and evacuating, less and less time being spent on registering the names of the dead, ensuring a proper burial, that their burial place is marked, and that's something that I look at over and over again. So that's what I look at for the most part in terms of these cases. And I'll say a couple of other things, and I'll come back to First Lieutenant Scania's I think of all the things, though, in those files that is difficult for researchers when you get to the part I didn't mention, which is the family correspondence, which is all in there. So I have all these dozens of cases I've looked at. I would say 90% of them, they include at least a few letters. You, of course, see the letters sent to the family notifying them that the individual is declared dead. That's bad enough. But then, of course, as you work your way through, you see then the letter about we've not been able to recover the remains. And where they inform the next of kin that the individual is 
not recoverable. That's the phrase you get over and over. Not recoverable. And they usually get a lot of, after a while it reads very generically, even though one can understand, I mean, you're dealing with this sheer, the sheer number of these cases, but they'll talk about, we hope that your son's sacrifice will be a source of, of sustained comfort for you and your family. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the part of this, we get more to this issue of the ethical side of this research, where you see next of kin engaged in all forms, and we would probably all do it, all forms of, of clutching at straws. You know, one of the things you see in the files is people, I had one case where an individual believed their son had suffered from amnesia, and it just wandered off someplace, and that's why he was never found. I had another who was convinced the Soviets had taken him hostage, and you know he was gone, probably in a Soviet labor camp <coughs> someplace. And you know then the the responses to the U.S. military: What can we do? Hiring private investigators, in some cases sending family members over to look. I had one particularly noteworthy incident of a mother who, every nine to twelve months until the late 1950s, she wrote if, with any new news about her son and of course this case has never been resolved she i guess eventually gave up in the late 1950s on getting anything authoritative so this work always really takes you have that side of it where you you have some at least detachment from it and then especially with the family correspondence makes you realize this is a person with a family and the like and they suffered on the one hand a loss that over 400,000 American families suffered in World War II, which is losing that individual. But they have a double loss insofar as that there are no remains and thus no gravesite. There's no tomb, there's no place that you can visit. And we think about like loved ones, where a place you can put flowers, a place you can put an inscription that recalls the memory of that individual. Obviously lots of people when they go visit a deceased loved one, they talk to that person. All that, of course, is denied families of the unrecovered. So my work really does try to resolve these cases. I look for leads, anything that might help indicating burial information that might help the help DPA have a better sense of how Americans were treated in a particular camp or were conditions like at that time. So some cases it's really like filling in a, a giant jigsaw puzzle with the work that I do. But people will always wonder, despite that, and I'm getting out here toward the end, well actually, let me hold on a second before I get to that. People will always wonder why it took so long. And why are so many of these still unaccounted for? And I'll go back to First Lieutenant Sconyers. But just to note a few things about problems that come up that you have to account for, and that is, in the case of First Lieutenant Sconyers, what we know now is that one of the reasons why he wasn't found is that evidently his body was exhumed and removed near Gdansk, Poland, present-day Gdansk, Poland, and buried side by side with French POWs who had originally been buried in Lubin along with them, close by, and evidently somebody mistook Ewart for Eduard. That name got put, it got associated with his remains, and so he was buried as a French soldier. And it took an individual, a researcher, who came, looked in the cemetery in Gdansk, saw the name and thought, that name looks, doesn't look like it fits, and began to do some digging and it took a period of years before it was finally discovered. And that's how, in fact, we, with a great deal of luck, were able to recover, identify, recover, and repatriate the remains of Lieutenant Sconyers. I'll just say a couple of other things about problems that you run into that really are of, there's really nothing the Americans, the you know, Great Registration Service people could have done when they were working on this. They were caught up in the politics of the Cold War. But as I noted, these 
POW camps here on the German-Polish or close to the German-Polish border. Much of eastern Germany, after the Potsdam Agreement, becomes Polish. So the Germans, not Germany not only loses its territory, but most of the Germans who have been living there are driven out. It's interesting, the documents I'm reading from the American side, 1948-49, they use the word evacuate. That's putting it gently. But in many cases, the Germans who've been living in these areas, they're just booted. So you'll have graves registration documents. They're looking for remains of Americans. So you start on 3C, or you can go even further up. 2B, they'll go into areas there are no Germans to interview. There are none left. The mayor is Polish. The new population of the town is Polish. It's got a new name. There are no Germans to talk to about what happened there in 1944. What were conditions like? We have no idea. We weren't here. And they weren't. That also kind of ties in with the fact that the Soviets, 1948-49, began to restrict access. In fact, in Poland, it's not even so much the Soviets as Polish authorities themselves. We'll let you in. Only if you have specific information about a grave site. Otherwise, no. No. And all the reports I see, especially in the Soviet-occupied zone, will become the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. There's a Soviet officer, sometimes two, that go out with a the team. They want to know what you're looking at. How long are you going to be there? So these are some of the obstacles that grave registration ran into that they simply couldn't foresee. And so 1950, a lot of the files I look at, you see file after file, deferred search, 1950. Political situation, too difficult. And what do you do to that? In some cases, they try and will obtain access. But by 1952-53, most of these are declaring not recoverable. It's not only the Cold War, the difficulty in getting access, but the Korean War. And so that's now the new concern starting after June 1950. There's still, in that case, some 8,000 or so Americans still unaccounted for for the Korean War. So that takes me to my final point that I'm going to see what questions you have. I noted here in doing this kind of work that we have a collaborative model here. And I pointed out this ethical dimension of doing work on MIA cases. In that there is a stereotype associated with history that one is objective, one is dispassionate or disinterested in the study of history, right? That one doesn't take sides or judge. Those are kind of classic stereotypes, and some of you might share those. But one of the things about doing this kind of work is that it has a very strongly ethical component to it, meaning that you're not just doing work to enlighten people or educate people, educate yourself. You're really doing work that's going to hopefully alleviate grief and suffering for people who've been waiting for answers for decades. In this case now, 70 plus years. And so, and for those of us doing this kind of work on the missing, there is a real commitment, an ethical task that comes with this and I, for one, take that very seriously. Thank you very much for your time. I thought I would just end here with a couple. I just put. I'll just leave these up. These are websites that might uh, you might find interesting. That will, if you want to continue this, DPA's own website. And I mentioned Kim Guise's site for her exhibit on German uh, on American POWs in Germany. Guests of the Third Reich. Both those are up there. Please have questions that you have. Yes? Oh, I'm just curious. Were, were the Soviet POWs housed in the same stalags with the Americans, or were they separate? You, they're housed in the same stalags in many cases, but they're always treated differently. And that's, in fact, from American prisoners who survive. We'll talk about that. So the Soviet Union never signed the Geneva Convention. And the Nazi regime, of course, uses that as an excuse to not follow it with regard. Of course, if you look at Nazi ideology, they would have treated Soviet POWs terribly regardless of whether they signed it. It was just a pretext. 
but you'll see American prisoners talk about the fact that Soviet officers have to work in these camps. American officers don't. British officers typically don't. Some cases, if they, you know, if they'll insist or volunteer, they might, but they're not really required to. Soviets, however, is a totally different story. The level of brutality is unbelievable. And this is, these are, by the way, POW camps where German Army or if they're Stalag Luft camps, they're maintained by the Air Force, by the Luftwaffe, so this is not SS. If you had SS there, it would be even worse. But they're treated badly enough by, by the German military. So yeah, there's a big gap between, I think the latest number, there was a German scholar named Christian Streit in the 1970s wrote a book called No Comrades. It was incredibly controversial, as you can you can might imagine, because he was talking about the role of the German army in these atrocities, and he estimated about 3.3 million Soviet POWs die in German hands. About 57 percent of the total of those captured. I was just going to say, my father liberated some of the German POW camps, and he, <coughs> he, he said he said the the way those. Soviets were treated was as bad as in the death camps if the Jews were treated that he saw a Soviet um, POW stumble and fall as they were leaving the camp and nobody realized he was in distress and he drowned in a mud puddle. He was so weak, he was so emaciated, he couldn't even pick up his head. That sounds like a lot of the stories that, that I run across you know, too. And it's just interesting the, when Americans liberate Soviet POWs or Soviets liberating Americans, there is that brief moment at the very end of the war where there is, I don't want to over-romanticize it, but I mean there is obviously a great deal of euphoria and goodwill at the level of the soldiers there and also telling the stories about these people who were treated so brutally who didn't survive. I mean, I think it's, oh, please, yes, you had your hand up early. Yes, sir. It's the same question, same thing you're talking about now. Uh, now, by background, just, I, I served with a group of repatriated and back in the Navy, in aviation, fellows during a period of time. And I heard a lot of stories, and one of the stories that had to impress me, one, one, one particular guy was in a Bataan death march, was the fact that our soldiers, when they were captured, were in, generally speaking, good health, uh, carrying full weight, maybe a little overweight, and that one of the key survival things was that the winners were particularly brutal in the 40s in Eastern Europe and that the Russians themselves had taken such poor care of their troops that they were damn near dead when they were captured. I mean, they didn't have enough food, they were uh, not clothed pro Anyway, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, it, it, it's unpleasant to think about it. And that this contributed mightily to the uh, remarkable statistics of how few of them made it through, and that they themselves felt, and that as aviators or aviator or flyers that were in the airplane, m most of the guys I would talk to would obviously be in that business because that's what I was in, and, and it, I'd ask them the same series of questions because I was curious. What I was wondering was, were the Germans more brutal than Japanese? And that's kind of where I was coming from. But I heard a lot about the general condition of the Soviet army and how what they cared about their own people to, to create some doubt. And I was, my question is, not your official position, but you've seen a lot of records. Do you feel that, that it was all due to man's inhumanity to man, or was some of it due to the fact that their own side had put them in an untenable situation in such a huge number, nobody could have fed them in the conditions they were in? 
you know, I think in the, the case of, I don't know if I made myself. Clear. No, no, I, 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 the, the way I would think I would respond to that, I think in the very early stages of, the, of Germany's war with the Soviet Union, you saw a lot more of that. The Soviets weren't really, um, Stalin may have been the most paranoid dictator of the 20th century, but he didn't expect an attack from Hitler, or certainly not in June of 41. The Soviets are not really prepared for that, and of course Stalin had killed much of the military leadership in the late 30s. So there is definitely cases where they had not were not really very well taken care of, but I would say 90 plus percent of the reason or the reasons for the high mortality rate is German maltreatment, miscontempt. I mean, the Germans literally on the SS side they ex they experiment with poison gas. It's used in the death camps first, often on Soviet prisoners of war. They would never have thought about doing that for American or British POWs. Yeah, now they, they were, were certainly going in, they were going to lose, and they were going to have to deal with. It. That's true, and so there's certainly cases of maltreatment. There are Americans who end up in Buchenwald in the concentration camp. I've even seen he's not, he's, he survived the war, but we know of one. American naval officer of all things who ends up in the concentration camp in Mauthausen is tortured there by the Gestapo. But it's rare. It's overall it's rare. Whereas in the case of the Soviets, also the Poles, in some cases Czechs, it's systematic and it's racial. They're subhumans. Certainly. Bobby, I think I saw you and then back over here, please. But just quickly, uh, when you're talking about sources, uh, I had two questions about sources. Mm -hmm. One is to what extent do other Americans in the camp provide information that you found? And secondly, what do you get, if anything, from International Red Cross? Those are great questions. So you, you get from American prisoners who survived a great deal. In many cases in the IDPFs, they will, of course, they had one individual from, say, Stalag 4A, they find out, okay, you were here during this time with these five other people. So they go out and find those five people, and they will write, you know, usually some, they'll have to, in fact, answer a set of questions. It's a questionnaire about what they saw of that individual, when was the last they saw him, what kind of condition was he in, how did the Germans treat him, etc. In some cases, it's extremely helpful. In some cases, it's not at all. It varies, but there is a lot of that. And of course, there are there's a really a large literature of memoirs by American POWs that's out there. Some really wonderful books, and so in some cases, it may not be the individual, but those memoirs will yield a lot of information about specific camps. Uh, the the other one you mentioned, you asked about with the Red Cross. There's lots of documentation there. Obviously, that's how the U.S. will learn about the deaths of these individuals. The Red Cross will report it, and they will, especially, you know, after hostilities have ceased, there will be a lot of cooperation. What did you know? When did you last have somebody in this camp? What were the conditions like? Those, those reports from the Red Cross are especially, not surprisingly, useful in the cases of malnutrition, disease, the like, that reflect the general conditions in the camps more than specific incidents with the Germans or not. I think I had a question over it. Yes, ma'am. I was curious how the whole process works. Do you have like electronic connection to the military to look at all the cases? And then do they hand you German documents? I assume that's why they use the museum is because you're good researchers, so it's mostly POW, not just the plane crash. Right. And then do you have German translators? Do they flag certain ones they think are easier to find for you? Yeah, and this, yeah, that's a great question because it gets into sort of the nuts and bolts of what I do. Uh, what, it's actually quite simple insofar as that DPA will send me a set of these files. Like we, these are the individuals we're trying to identify. And they, they'll be in batches typically, but you'll get a batch of these IDPFs, and they will say, we need you to just comb through this. Take detailed notes. They'll often have a set of questions. They'll want to be able, you know, what can you find in this that might be useful. I can read German, so I don't need to ask anybody for help with that. Now, in some cases, you'll see other languages, documents from other languages in there, but it's pretty rare. Like, for example, there's Polish documents. These camps that end up in present-day Poland, but most of those have already been translated by 
by military personnel. They've hired translators to do that. So that's generally how it works. It's actually quite simple. And then I check back in with them periodically about what I've been able to find. Yes, please. How has uh, DNA and the um, changes in that technology helped what goes on? It has been a revolution uh, in work on these kind of cases, but my colleague, Clarice Soper, she is going to talk about that extensively in two weeks. And so um, I don't want to steal her thunder. I couldn't gotcha. if I wanted to because mitochondrial, I'm just glad if I can spell the word, much less kind of understand all the ins and outs of it. But Clarice is going to give a presentation on that. And it's, it's very interesting and, and amazing, really, the leaps that's happen in that field and what that's meant for helping with these cases. More to come. You got it. Yes. Please. Well, also, I noted on the, uh, one of the maps you showed that uh, North America and South America were both in circle there with regard to POWs or MIAs. How does that fit into this whole picture? Yeah, there's some cases here from the United States. We have not really even been in much communication with DPA, quite frankly, about those. I haven't done any work on those. But many of these cases, noted here is North America, are merchant marine cases, U.S. Navy, usually German submarines. And those are mostly losses from Germany's submarine war that have not been recovered, and as you can imagine, are, will be some of the most difficult cases to resolve. Thank you. You're welcome. Please, Gunter. Yeah, Jason, thank you for an interesting talk. I came late. Uh, just a few reflections on POW research. You know, generally speaking, the historical profession, specifically military historians, are not interested in POW research. Maybe because of your final reflections on the ethical issues. They want to do operational history, they want to do battles, they want to do strategic history. And I would say the American, the, the American World War II Museum here is of the same ilk. Whenever I raced with uh, the, the big international conference, the issue, let's do a POW panel, uh, it never ended up in the program because they think people are just interested in operational and battle history. When in fact, I would say, in the life of uh, any soldier in World War II, very often they spend more time in POW camps than on the battlefield. Yes. So why this interest? I'd like you to reflect about this a bit. And then finally, in terms of POW research, where the frontier is today, next to what you are doing is actually German historians are interested in the fact that British and Americans essentially uh, put people into camps, Germans, officers in Trent Park in England and Norman uh, common soldiers in Fort Hunt in Maryland, and they surveilled them. They listened into their conversations, mm -hmm. and all of it is now available on transcripts. And we know a lot about the final days of the Nazi regime and how German thought from those transcripts, a fascinating new source. And the other frontier of research is actually what uh, young scholars in Germany and Austria are doing, namely the downing of Allied airmen and the lynching of them on the ground. And the recent study of two young Austrian historians have established in Austria and Hungary 110 American airmen that were lynched, that is killed by people on the ground. Uh, are you at all going into that kind of historical evidence? Uh, those two researchers, by the way, were here in the presentation. Thank you for that. That's, that's, you raised two or three really important issues, I think, for this kind of research. And so the first to say about why there's not more on this I think that what you pointed to already has a, some, a kernel of insight about the fact that I think typically in terms of the history of the war, more people are interested in combat and in operations. And the, in, for one thing, it's interesting too that we don't really have a comprehensive history in English of the German Stalag system. 70 plus years later with all the material out there. I mean, it's remarkable. You get studies of particular camps. You'll get some issue about comparing treatment, but like a comprehensive history of the camps, we don't really have yet. I know the Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. that was putting out, I think in the next year, year and a half, an encyclopedia. They, of course, had an encyclopedia of all the concentration and extermination <coughs> camps. 
but they're going to have an encyclopedia that includes materials in all the German POW camps. So that, I think, will may help generate some more interest in this topic. But yeah, you raise a good point. I mean, many of these Americans, I have guys who are captured at the Kasserine Pass. They're in German custody for two plus years. You know, some like Lieutenant Scania is not quite a year and a half, but he's, he's there for a long time in German hands. And so here at the museum and beyond, I think, I hope that our work and the partnership with DPA generates and pushes that process forward. You noted about the issue, too, about the lynching of American pilots. That's the exception to my comments about, for the most part, the Germans adhering to the Geneva Conventions. Even though it's interesting, most of those killings really take place very soon after these pilots are captured. So they never really get pulled into the prison apparatus as most of these other individuals do. They're killed very shortly thereafter. And the cases you mentioned from, from Austria, there are also one notorious case from the summer of 1944, B-17 shot down off the coast of northwestern Germany. The Germans captured all the crew and civilian authorities and police, etc. They murdered these pilots. In fact, they marched them into an area where they would encounter German civilians, and they were killed. I think seven of them. And the Americans tried many of the people, including the civilians, in a war crimes trial in 1945, the Borkum case, I'm sure you're aware of. So these things certainly did happen, especially with the case of pilots, Goebbels, really ramps up, escalates the rhetoric about pilots that they're essentially terrorists or air gangsters, murderers. <laughs> And that does have some effect later on. But it's still pretty remarkable the restraint, though, in the camps the Germans show toward Americans and British prisoners in general. Other questions? Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.